pagan sources. And that is why Geisler said it is one of the most attested events of the ancient world. So it's how, how can you say it's legend when uh, all sources are represented by uh, which attest to the fact of the cross? If that is the point of the question, uh, the historicity of the cross, even unbelieving scholars do not question that. Uh, of course, in the Quran, they would say it was not Jesus who was crucified, but Judas. And uh, again, this is written more than 500 years after the fact. I'm talking here of testimonies within the 100 years. I, some of them even to the point of the actual contemporary of uh, the event. So we have very well attested event as history. Mark, uh, a preacher, how should we challenge or call sinners that is not in line with Armenian invitation? We'll just use the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament language is come to Christ, repent, believe. In fact, it is so richly uh, spelled out in various terms, hindi ka maubusan. And depending on the situation, uh, you can use any of these uh, expressions of the New Testament. And the point is, we are inviting them to come to Christ. When you make it a physical act, you are inviting them to the front of the church, which they wrongly call the altar, or they are invited to raise their hands. And as one preacher said, Christ is closer to you than the distance your heart, uh, your hand uh, extends when you raise it. So why do you need to raise your hand? Uh, in other words, to come to Christ. And you do not need to step with your feet to come to Christ. Uh, the invitation is to repent and to believe. And therefore, let's just use what the New Testament uses for invitation. Now, the idea many times is, oh, that I want to see who. I want a public display of who. Well, there is a public display of who. Baptism. So why do we add to that? <clears throat> why should we change how did the disciples know that there were 3,000 added to the church on the day of Pentecost? They were baptized. So the public confession of faith is not coming forward, not raising the hand, not repeating a public prayer, but by baptism. Not that baptism is saving, but we're asking here, what is public confession? That public confession is baptism. Then it's CBCD. What is the difference between semi-Pelagianism and Arminianism? If they are wrong in their position in the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, is it safe to say that their faith may be questionable for clarification? There are four, there are four basic systems as far as soteriology is concerned. Pelagian. Pelagian is saying, will alone. You know, Pelagian's view in the first and fifth debate believe that every man born is like Adam's condition in Eden, sinless until he sins. So it's by will alone. Semi Pelagian says, why will alone? We need the grace of God. So they make it will plus grace. So that's Charles Finney and others like him. And then Armenians would argue, why make grace secondary to will? And so what they say is grace first. That is what you have in what is known as prevenient grace. Prevenient grace means God has given grace to every man enough for him to believe if he will respond. But having given prevenient grace, now it's up to man. So grace plus will. 
Now the reform position is from beginning to end, it's grace alone. Sola gratia. So those are the four bodies of theology in quick summary. But we'll learn more of that in similar faith, not necessarily, at least these three will still one way or the other be able to believe in the gospel with much ignorance on the part of the semi-Pelagian with impoverishment on the part of the Armenian, but they can still have the gospel. But this definitely is unchristian because if you do not depend on the grace of God in any sense, then uh, how can you be a believer in the gospel? Uh, Roland Antonio just want to appreciate the teaching in Kulang Putarinig. Now, is it sin for the evangelicals if they continue doing such teaching? Please give us some biblical verse. Which teaching? Marami akong binanggit na uh, wrong teaching. Uh, I mean, all of these are wrong. But some can, it is possible for, for example, I mentioned the Armenian uh, theology. One can be Armenian and still believe in the gospel sincerely and believingly, that is, savingly. Uh, John Wesley is a good example. He was a thorough Armenian, in fact, militantly Armenian in his theology, but he was a believer in the gospel. Uh, but uh, I, I would be hesitant to if he were alive to call him to my pulpit to preach. Uh, and yet, I will embrace him as a brother in Christ. So, uh, but the Pelagian, and in the case even of the semi-Pelagian, uh, I would be very hesitant to even start a fellowship, although I believe a semi-Pelagian may still be a believer in the gospel. Uh, Joshua, what can you say about Amiraldianism? Uh, we'll have more of that. In fact, we didn't we study that in the in, in history. The developments post-reformation is Amiraldianism. The idea of the Amiraldian is that uh, God the Father has chosen those whom he will save, but Christ died to save those even that the Father has not chosen. So it introduces a, a division within the persons of the Godhead, and that is impossible. And so the fault of the Amiraldian is that it thinks of the cross of Christ contrary to the Father's will. Whereas Jesus consistently said in John chapter 6, I came to do the Father's will, that all those whom he has given to me I will lose no one. And therefore, the redemptive act of Jesus on the cross is consistent with the Father's will. We will have that more in the extent of the atonement. Not just in soteriology. Uh, uh, one of the lectures we have in the atonement is the extent. So wait for that. Other questions? Let's take a break.